Good morning. Is everybody out there ready? Here we go. One, two. There you go. That song is called Jada, and it was written by Bob Carlton in 1918. And I'm telling you, that is a jazz standard. No matter where you were to go in the United States, if there's a jazz band, well, Dixieland jazz band, I should say, chances are you're going to hear that tune. Just imagine. That's 101 years old, <clears throat> still being played all over the place. That's what you call our song. I mean, these songs rack it down through the ages. Anyway, um, there's your cultural enrichment for today. And there's no other place you can go on the Internet or on television where the program starts. And it's an interview program, and the host comes on and plays his horn and plays a song that's 50 to 100 years old. And you can enjoy a little bit of music to start your day off and maybe hear a song that you've never heard before. So cultural enlightenment. Where do you go for that? You come here, and that's Life After Scientology. I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. So before we go any further, let me put my horn away. And a little business. If any of you out there are not patrons, I invite you to join today. Your help is very much appreciated, and we'd like to get this program. Well, as a matter of fact, you can do two things. Become a patron and get somebody else to subscribe and watch this and have them subscribe, get other people to subscribe. I'd like to get the show to be about 10 times as big as it is right now because it's an important subject and it's important that you get enlightened on this particular group, the cult of Scientology, and how bad they are for people to get involved with and uh, just get enlightened on all the points that we're bringing up on it. So you're forewarned. Anyway, uh, this morning... I have one of my favorite guests back, um, Karen De La Carrier, and without any further words, I'd like to say good morning, Karen, and welcome back to the show. I appreciate your coming on again. Hi, Ron. Good morning. Hi, right. everybody. Okay. Now, uh, as I recall, we were talking about Captain Bill Davidson on the last show, and uh, we went into the fact that he was actually given a promotion to be the deputy commodore, in other words, the second guy in charge of Scientology by L. Ron Hubbard himself, went to Los Angeles, became the commanding officer of AOLA, Advanced Organization Los Angeles, and he had some of his Sea Org members go out on the top of the building and look to see if they could find any alien spaceships. This is, he actually did that, okay? Another thing he did was he got them to go out and see if they could find psychiatrists. I don't know where the hell they went to look for, in telephone booths <laughs> or houses or what. I mean, let's face it, this is off the wall. This is not, this is not straight ahead stuff. So he did these things. And I promised that we would tell what the final analysis on this was. So why don't you go ahead and, and, and tell us what you know about this. What finally did happen to Captain Bill? Well, he, you know, he, when you act out that wild, the, the news eventually trickles up the command chain. And there were reports on his odd behavior of <laughs> looking for psychiatrists in Los Angeles in this sinister way. In, in, they were like ninja warriors. They were you know, dressed in dark clothes and they were looking for psychiatrists. And this was, so he got recalled to the Apollo, but he never got any cramming. Cramming means correction in terms of theory and ideology. He didn't get, he didn't do any deck work, nothing. He went, he sailed straight onto a post. And, you know, because he, his, odd and bizarre behavior 
was not caught and examined and looked at, he then went off further and further into, I don't want to, a lot of people that belong, he, he founded an offshoot of Scientology called Ron's Org, which is headquarters in Switzerland, but it's mostly in Russia. And lots of Scientology is illegal in Russia. Did you know that, Ron? The, 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 they raid the, the, yes. Yes, I the did Russian know that. government every three to six months raid one of the churches. Uh, yeah. Putin is very, very uh, hostile to Scientology. And one time when the cult was taking down videos and trying, well, they're toothless now. They hardly take down a video now that's... Well, when they were taking down videos, people would go to what's called our YouTube, Russian YouTube. And then overnight, all of the Russian YouTube Scientology videos vanished. Mm. So who knows what goes on in Russia? Anyway, Bill, Captain Bill Robertson is his name, not Davidson, Robertson. Right. Captain Bill Robertson... Um, uh, at least did a breakaway from the clutches and the stern stirrups. He let people practice. They do a lot of the harmless lower level stuff on communication and problems. That That's what they do in the, the Russian Ronzorg. Yeah. But they're not under, they're not under church domination. Anyway, he, he, <laughs> Captain Bill believed that he was channeling Hubbard and that Hubbard was telepathically reeling. And then Captain Bill, <laughs> he kind of did a sort of a mockery of the Sea Org. This was all galactic patrol, he called himself called his group galactic intergalactic and he was very very much uh stuck you could say into ot3 and xeno really you know i i want to branch off captain bill into the fact that i want to explain something to the audience now remember i did it all yeah. i did everything yeah i did every course under the sun I worked and worked, and again, I've explained to you in an earlier video, when you believe, <laughs> you're trapped, you're screwed, you believe, yeah. even if the evidence is contrary, you ignore the evidence, and you believe, this is it, <laughs> and I believed in it all, and I did it all. One of the most incredible things in Scientology that everybody swallows and everyone believes is that when you travel back trillions of years in time in counseling, you will get the secrets of why you are messed up. And it's, it's absolutely incredible to believe this, but th the reason you're messed up is there were all these implants. A Scientology definition of implant is something put in your head forcibly through electronics, through electric shock, through hyp hypnosis, through whatever kind of trick trickery was used, you were these commands were embedded into you. Right. Just to give you an everyday example. If anyone saw the movie The Manchurian Candidate, right, right. the guy was, he was given an embedded thought to kill or to harm. Well, that's a typical implant. And Hubbard believed that if you went back, 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 and he's got counseling tools to 
make you go back in time. The reason, for example, you are oversexed and you got to get laid and you got to screw every person around is because 93 million years ago, the psychiatrists embedded this urge in you through an implant. And a lot of Scientology is based on this, yeah. huge amount. The whole of the clearing course to make you go clear is running implants. That's all it is. Yeah. It, you, you run out on the e-meter this implant. The whole of OT2, backwards and forwards, it's implant, 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 implant. The whole of OT3, this sci-fi incident of Xenu and uh, capturing you and freezing you and transporting you to Earth and so on and so on. Implant. And Hubbard truly believed that the reason you have case, and you know, to this day, I shake, I've got, I've got friends who still do, do it all and they, their win is that they discovered a new implant 83 trillion years ago. Such and such happened and this and this and this. And no wonder they were <clears throat> had a food diet eating problem. Or no wonder they were drinking too much. Because the psychiatrist embedded this thing in their head. I, 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 I printed out this to show you. Am I doing this right, Frank? Yep, it's perfect. That's a picture of uh, Pat Broker, and that picture was taken at the event where they announced that L. Ron Hubbard had, quote, dropped his body. He didn't die. He dropped his body. And Pat Broker come out, and what he's holding up is a sheet. Shall I say this or no? Yes, please. And See, on this that, is all blurry, but those are numbers. Those are yeah, numbers. I'll explain it. That sheet goes, I don't know how many lines across, but at least 25 or 35 lines. And these are number of years ago that L. Ron Hubbard went back and dated. In other words, got the exact date of something that happened then. When I say date, he talks in like quadrillions of years, trillions of years, hundreds of billions, millions, thousands, days, minutes, and seconds, not just to a day or a year. It, you get down to the second. And he's showing this to show off that L. Ron Hubbard dated this incident, and it is just beyond belief. But that was done to show everybody in the audience how brilliant L. Ron Hubbard was and uh, say what you want then, Karen. Yeah, the blurry things you see here, that you did it perfectly, Ron. These were numerical numbers of how far back in time Hubbard was able to detect with an e-meter. But the point of all this mumbo jumbo, I know it sounds almost like voodoo, is Scientologists sincerely believe that something that they believe, because they believe, they believe, you know, you existed and had different incarnations millions, trillions of years ago. But the fact that they believe that something that happened to you X trillion years ago is now the why for your aberration is just nonsense. It is. I mean, it, it's me. But the, this is what, I, <laughs> the, when you believe, and you've just given them $50,000 to do all this on you, you will believe. Yeah. So in a way, you're shifting the buck. You're not saying, I screwed up, I did this. No. The screw up was because a psychiatrist. Did it to you. <laughs> right. And they all come from a planet called the Farsec. Is that right? Farsec was an original. Yeah. 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 The original, yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. And I'll bet there's not one goddamn psychiatrist who knows that. We should go and tell them that and say, hey, you know where your ancestors came from? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. boy, you gotta get yeah. a little lighthearted because it is truly the uh, insane. But look, Karen, you're guilty and I'm guilty. We we both believe that. You know we, that. We we believed all this. We Book believed all this. And, and neither of us, uh, you know, we're not dummies. I mean, we might not be the smartest people, but we're sure as hell not the dumbest people on this planet. And I know many of my friends who are pretty brilliant. I mean, and good at what they do. I mean, brilliant songwriters and. Uh, actors and they believe this it's a hell of a hell of a thing isn't it can you just to make the point i sent you a little blurb on what hubbard wrote in the book scientology 8808 on the fifth invader force i, I have would that you, here would I'll, you read it i will read it yes fifth invader force a thetan that when i say thetan we're talking about a spiritual being okay a spirit just what we call a human being. Yeah, okay. A, a human being, which in Scientology, you're a spirit plus your meat body. Right. Right? Okay. A Thetan from, and this is called Fifth Invader Force. A Thetan from the Fifth Invader Force believes himself to be a very strange insect-like creature with unthinkably horrible hands. He believes himself to be occupying such a body but is in actuality simply a unit capable of producing space, time, energy, and matter. And that's from the book Scientology 88008, page 132. <laughs> and you know there are offshoots of Scientology. Yeah. Uh, I think a little bit of Captain Bill's thing as well, where they believe that there are there are these giant lizards that are kind of waiting in the clouds and outer parameters. And these lizards are very much beaming into people's heads. And they, they are, it's almost like Jurassic Park. Yeah. You know, these huge things. And it's a belief. People believe it. Okay, listen, I'm, I'm on a roll now, okay? Because <laughs> you mentioned about uh, Captain Bill having people spot spaceships from the Marcab Confederacy. Uh -huh. I think, or we mentioned it. And in here, in my notes here, there's also another explanation of this. And this is from a, a, br a briefing tape that L. Ron Hebert gave in August 6th of uh, 1963. And he explains the Markab Confederacy. Let me read this. Markab Confederacy. Various planets united into a very vast civilization which has come forward up through the last 200,000 years is formed out of the fragments of earlier civilizations. In the last 10,000 years, they have gone on with a sort of a, decad a decadent kicked in the head civilization that contains automobiles, business suits, fedora hats, telephones, <laughs> and spaceships. A civilization which looks almost exact duplicate, it, but is worse off than the current U.S. civilization. That's his explanation of a Markab confederacy. And I thought, you know, how else are they going to hear about this? Well, right here on life after Scientology. So you know, you know about that, and you know about the fifth invader force. You're set to go. Play the lottery <laughs> today, you're going to win the goddamn thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, you know, I believe in reincarnation. It's an old Buddhist concept. I believe that one lives on and so on. Yeah. But, but this, th th this, this mock-up confederacy and stuff, Hubbard said that this civilization is simply a, a, a redo of many, many earlier civilizations. Yeah. He says on the famous Class 8 tape that the cars they were driving 75 million years ago were exactly like the Ford Motor Car Company 
produces except, in this day and age. Except I'll bet they never invented the Etzel. Anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> and the DC-7 and DC-8 jets 75 million years ago were exactly like what Boeing produces in this day and age. Yep. And, you know, once you believe, and you believe Hubbard is source, then his word... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, what one of the technicians is yawning. I, I don't blame you for yawning. This is like. <laughs> okay, just let me so, say something. You gotta yeah. admit, it's pretty interesting reading. I mean, <laughs> this is really creative. When you think about it, yeah. I could see people reading this thing and oh Christ, this can't be true. Wow, but let me read a little further because it's just. It's like a story that somebody is telling. Well, it is a story that somebody told. He made up this fucking story. Well, the question really is, this. the question comes down to, did Hubbard really believe all this? Did he believe it? Or was he spinning a yarn? He told many, many stories of his previous reincarnations. Yeah. He claimed to be this and that and the other. But... I believe that he believed it. You might be right, and I'll tell you another thing I think, and this is my personal opinion and my personal observation. I think he would promise things, just come to his head, so he'd promise it, thinking he'll work it out later, how he can do it. And that's mm. where he dug a hole for himself. Like, yeah, absolutely, you know, you'll be exterior from your body, be able to go to Germany and read a newspaper over there. And then later on, let's see, how the hell am I going to do that? Uh, you know, and maybe underneath all this, maybe there was this desire to help, which then got overwhelmed by his lust for money and power and vengeance on others. And and that won out in the end. You see what I'm saying, Karen? Yeah, yeah. That's just my opinion yeah. here, but the hell I'm entitled to it just like anybody is. Yeah. R remember how he said he went to heaven? I do remember that. That was in... Uh, HCOB, a Harvard Communication Office bulletin, and it starts off with saying, I, I think this morning, I went to heaven. And he then describes in this, and it's a quite lengthy uh, article, how heaven was m mocked up to have plaster statues and various things there that you would think that you were in heaven, but it was all an implant. Yeah. You see, that, that's the problem with Scientology. It always goes back to being some kind of implant. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if they did this to you. When I started acting up and saying, you know, I was going to leave in face, I was going to put my car through the gates and stuff, the thing that they, when they hurl you into a room to make you confess crimes and so, the one thing they hop on is, were you sent in to harm Scientology by an implant? Yeah. And whenever somebody went crazy on the Apollo, we had a couple of people that went completely thing. The the whole thing was they were implanted to do this. Yeah. There's always this little little bit of a thing where, ah, we know why you're acting so crazy. Yeah. Psychiatrists have embedded an uh, impulse for you to harm. Yeah. Uh, are you really with me? This is hogwash. Yeah. This is just nonsense. Well, now you Absolute said you, you said when when you talked about running your car through the gate and all the things. No, Karen, I never did any of that because let me tell you, in the position I was in, being the father of the chairman of the board, if I had even mentioned that to somebody. I would still be locked up in solitary yeah. confinement, separated from my wife, and being interrogated every day till the end of my life. That was what would have happened to me. Nope, I kept yeah. that to myself. And I successfully, after planning it out for six months, was able to evade being stopped and then being captured. And that was on March 25, 2012. And I still have the little notebook at home where I wrote the things that I wanted to take and the things I wanted to leave. But I can see your point. You get to the point where you think, this is absolute fucking insanity. I got to get out of here. <laughs> I, had to squash, I had to squash that feeling in order to be yeah. successful at, 
at the plan I had. But anyway, continue on. I just wanted to throw that two cents in there. Yeah. No, the, the fact of the matter is my son was two years old. My ex-husband, Heba, was in Germany on assignment. There was no one to take my two-year-old home. And I was a new mom, first child. It was frantic. I wanted to get out of there. But this, this, is, this is what they did. They got me in a room. And they asked me this kind. Now, remember, up to that point, I'd been dedicated, almost flawless, high-producing staff member. You know, just just a really, really good, dedicated, loyal member. Yeah. They got me in a room, and this is the kind of question they asked me, Ron. Did you ever in an incident of anesthesia, did anybody give you suggestions? Now, look, I'm already a class 12 CS. I wasn't born on a banana boat. <laughs> I, I know that culture. I know Hubbard inside out, upside down. So they're basically saying, have you been, the reason that I wanted to leave that god awful place was that a psychiatrist had put that intention into my head. Can you believe that? And the questions got more and more bizarre. Uh, do you feel that things come to you in the night? Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, I, I want to tell you, now, now that jogged my memory. Do things come to you then? I want to tell you this very quickly there was a guy who he had done ot8 oh i may have told you that story before the the guy who had done ot8 and he had sort of visitations of he felt people were in his room didn't i tell you that story no, I, before well, maybe you did but I don't, I don't recall it though karen well on the ship he felt some presence but he kept saying he was half asleep, half awake, so he couldn't truly give credibility to it. Right. <gasps> they jumped on him for confessionals. This was absolute. Uh, this was, ooh, psychiatrists could be infiltrating. Hmm. And they kicked him out. He'd, here's, here's, here's another guy who gave them a million dollars. The guy from Colorado, $1 million, and booted out. They made him leave as a security risk. He went to flag. Flag wouldn't hardly, you know, when you are deemed a security risk. Your career is this, over. And this is what the church does. Yeah. What, what the cult does is you're a security risk because there's a connection to psychiatry. Yeah. This, this is paranoia. This yeah, is it totally completely, is. utterly par paranoid. And you it, know, it traces back to L. Ron Hubbard. This is not something that somebody at a lower level does. And that's what we got to make the point here, that we're not talking about people on the lower echelon making up these questions or coming up with this idea. This goes right back to what they call source. It's a hell of a notion, isn't it? You know, there's about six or seven people all hooked up with each other that were spent hours and hours a day with Hubbard every day. They're still alive, and they're all hooked up. And the one common adjective that they give about Hubbard is paranoid. He yeah. was paranoid. Wow. Well, I tell you, I think we've accomplished what we wanted to do with this uh, interview. And uh, I want to appreciate, I got to tell you, I appreciate you coming on, Karen, because this is truly a, a prison of belief, isn't it? it is a, prison you, of belief. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. you, you build your own mental prison with this outfit. I, I urge you, don't get near it. And those of you who may be a little bit on the fence thinking, should I stay or shouldn't I? You know, walk out. Just say, Fuck it, and I'm leaving. Don't disregard what they tell you. Disregard them. Don't even pay them any attention. Pay them the same amount of attention you play 
to a dog that barked at you on the street. You wouldn't stop and say, hey, why are you barking at me? What the hell? At that point, you're nuts. And you got to swallow your pride and say, hey, wait a minute. I was conned. And get out of there, my friend. And I wish you all the best. And uh, I know Aftermath has a program. If you need some help, you can get in touch with them. And they have a program where they'll help you get a job and maybe help you out with some money. And they're out there and they're doing the job and people are coming to them for help and you will get it. So don't feel you're alone in this. Anyway, just to wrap up, I'd like to invite all of you to become patrons. If you would, I'd appreciate it very much. That helps the ongoingness of this program and um, also get other people to subscribe so we can make this about 10 times as big as it is and we'll have a greater effect than we have right now. The more people that know about this, the better off we're going to be. And Karen, for whatever reason, I'm going to get you back on again because you have a, a brilliant outlook on this stuff and people benefit from listening to these and listening to what you have to say about it. So I want to thank you very much for coming on. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Okay, and this is Life After Scientology, and I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. I will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now.